I had a note here, but it's just hard. So thank you so much for the reminding. So we are recording this, so we will have this available on our YouTube. Um, so the folks that are on are many of them are master gardeners and master naturalists. We had a couple of people register and um, they haven't signed on as of yet. So maybe they'll sign on a little, little later, but some folks that are outside of our group, which is great always to have some new people. So um, everybody's gonna have pictures in a different location, but Lori Henderson is here. Uh, Lori is a master gardener and a master naturalist. Um, I almost forget sometimes Lori that you're a master gardener because she's very involved in natives and in natural plantings and things of that nature. So sometimes I forget that you are talented on the, the horticulture side too. It's all horticulture, isn't it? Yeah. So the other two folks aren't online at this point, but um, uh, so we'll have open discussion on some questions and answers. If uh, Lori can't answer or wants to uh, defer to someone who she thinks is online that might know the answer and Chris is online too. Uh, Chris Luking is the horticulture educator for our unit, which is our five counties, um, which again, we're all familiar with each other, so we know it. So she's online today too. I think she's working at a different office perhaps, but so she'll be able to help us out with some questions too, if we have it. So let's concentrate on Marie. She's being real dedicated here. She's brought a weed in today. She'd like to know what it is by tonight. <laughs> it's very <laughs> delicate. She said white flowers. The leaves are in three. <laughs> Like the flowers have four petals split. They're kind of like a cross look. Okay. Good. Oh, um, yeah. Um, One thing I can say about this is this is the way we get, we get weeds in the office and they're difficult sometimes, especially if they've dried out or been folded in a jean pocket like this one maybe has been. Um, so yeah, the flower is very, I cannot show you the flower because it's wilted enough that it doesn't yeah. show up. So. so some of you who do this kind of work are looking after the fact. You might um, learn some skills with your smartphones because I think probably close to all of us now have smartphones because that's the others aren't being supported anymore. <laughs> so that would help to see that flower. I wish we could be a little bit more. Does anybody have any thoughts on her, her weed just knowing? the habitat and the, the delicate look to it that might have an idea what that could be yeah it was along a path that was pretty it would be pretty compacted soil so the interesting thing is is it um prolific i mean oh there, yeah so it's like a, it's a good good weed right i mean it grows there's a lot of it there where i where i pulled it from it was the ground cover was this weed okay yeah. okay does it, is it, do you think it's an annual weed? Do you think it's going to die down? Have you seen it before where it might die down? Before, well, uh... it, Marie, does it look like I this think one it, a little bit more? It's hard to tell, but is it split like that with the four petals? Yeah, that's sort of like it, but the seeds on that are long and skinny. These are oval. These are See, the, oval? The seeds are what is... Those little, those green blobs up there are the seeds, and they're they're an oval. Password. Um, do you know the names? They're yeah. Okay, an yeah. oval, not 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 the skinny. I don't know. Okay, yeah, I, I was seeing the the split leaves. Yeah. No, yeah, well, yours yours had skinny. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sarah, but do you it, have it, any it, idea? Oh, it's hard. It's got a little white. She said a white petal split white petal. Flower. Yeah. And the, those are not, those are seeds. Those aren't leaves that are. Yes, there. those okay. are seeds. The leaves is a, is a, it comes out of a, a base. See the base is like, it has leaves that, let me see if I can get the leaves for you to see. They're just a, a, a whirl of long kind of thin little leaves. So it, it comes out of a whirl and it has these uh, flowers that come up and they have the little white flower on the end of it. It's, uh, that's why it reminded me of the shepherd's purse, which is you know, about one, one of this, but it's very much more delicate. I don't There's know. 
It's a little hard for me to, to tell. I'm looking at a tiny picture on my phone. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I agree. I don't, I don't know. It's just, and it's it's dancing around a lot. So I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm dancing. I can't keep it. <laughs> I know. Uh, that rosette, though, it looks almost looks like it might be a maybe like a second year annual. I don't know. Uh -huh. I don't know either. I, I just know I see it here, but that doesn't mean anything. You know, if somebody had, uh, um, one of the, the easy, I'll say the best ways that I've learned to identify things is to take a picture of it with your phone in the moment and then try to use, um, I know Diane, yeah. she really likes, and uh, math, what's it called, iNaturalist. Um, what are some of the other ones? But uh, uh, Diane, what's the one that you use where you can like take like a little video? It's Seek. S E E K. It's connected. That's to what I this is. You know that no, it's, a, it's a type of, of um, um, it's a it's an it's an app that would be on a on the web. You know, a cell phone that when you take a picture of it, it will kind of search the database mm. and give you some choices, and then you can choose the one that looks the most like what you have. And in in the neighborhood, sometimes it'll be able to identify it straight away, but uh, it'll at least get you in the in the category of like uh, it, and that can sometimes help you then, you know, narrow and go a little further. There, as as we proceed, maybe some of us can do some research and uh, maybe check your uh, check your email before the end of the. Uh... Hey guys, just if, just if, I don't know who if somebody might have a radio on or having some conversation. You might want to mute yourself until you're ready to speak because it's interrupting. I think the listening ability for a lot of people. I don't know what that's about. So, um, anyways, and then maybe Marie, check your email before you go to your meeting, and see if uh, and see if uh, somebody answers her, and you can send it to myself or Chris, and we'll get forwarded to her. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, that's well. We appreciate the challenge. Unfortunately, it didn't work for us today, did it? Um, <laughs> So, I should have tried it. I didn't have my phone with me or I could have taken a picture. But yeah. I, well, I mentioned I'm, earlier about daffodils because we're all enjoying those because they're like, they bring on the spring for us. Um, does anyone want to discuss and answer the question about foliage on daffodils? Because a lot of people want to know when they can mow the foliage down. And there's questions about um, the timing on that. Some people like to braid that. There's some controversy on that. So um, I'll start with you, Lori, if you want to make any comments on it, and then you can pick someone to answer it if you choose to. She doesn't do that. You're muted, hon. Thank you. Thank you. I muted myself when you asked. Yeah, well, there was some noise okay. back though. My, my understanding is uh, whether or not you that you leave the foliage up until it begins to at least kind of yellow or start to fade before you mow it so that the plant has had enough time to kind of photosynthesize and recharge the bulbs before you get rid of it. Uh, unless you want your daffodils and then you should mow it over, you know, sooner. <laughs> but if you want them to, you know, if you want them to keep them again or keep them for next year, then I, I think you wait until they start to show signs of of yellowing or drying or kind of fading a little bit. That's that's my uh, best knowledge about what you Yeah, do. so yeah, brings that food down. Julie, do you have any bulbs that you have that you have any special care for that you want to share with some bulb care? She's got quite a quite a flower garden, so I thought she might have some input on her her blossoms. God, I had my mute on. Um, the only thing that, that I've tried to do now uh, recently is because, you know, the, the foliage on your daffodils, it seems like it stays green forever. And so if you want to plant annuals, it's like, okay, this is still standing here, but I can't take it down. So what I've tried to start doing is planting it by 
things that are already similar to it. Um, like, you know, like day lilies are something like, that. you know, they're kind of, kind of blend in with it, but I know day lilies and daffodils will fight each other. But, um, but if you can find something that um, comes out green and, and it's kind of uh, in the same fam, not necessarily family, but the same daffodil, then you can almost just kind of hide it for a while. So that works fairly well. That's what I started doing. That's an excellent idea. Um, that's an excellent idea. We had a, uh, we had, still have an educator. She just doesn't work in our immediate um, um, unit, but she um, gave a talk on irises and what to plant after the irises were done. And she, her, 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 her uh, idea was very similar to what you just suggested to get like, look, well, it's hard to say that, plants that look similar, strap-like foliage, for example, and then they don't stand out as much, especially like tulips are another one uh, that are hard to match up. So that's an excellent, excellent, uh, excellent talk. Um, does anybody mind if I do a little, um, little pick and choose here on some folks? Because a lot of people are out um, doing some, maybe some early mushroom hunting, but for the, they're also looking for wildflowers. And I know, um, Lori, you recently walked through some woods that you own. And you want to tell some, some some people what you've seen and perhaps uh, what's what's coming out if they went this weekend. What would they likely see, depending on the zone, the area? Yeah, um, you know, earlier I would say that that it's it's possible you might still uh, bloodroot blooming, but those are more or less you're going to just find the leaves out now. There's going to be fewer and fewer flowers. There's there's very sure. few. That are still flowering in our woods. The Dutchman's breeches mm -hmm. are kind of in their prime. You know, they're flowering, flowering all over. Um, the the is it called the prairie trillium? The the trillium that's got the red flower. Um, those are those are in various stages. Some of mine are are beginning to bloom. Others are still kind of just coming up. Um, there's in our woods, there's some cut leaf toothwort that is out there um, that's starting to to uh, to flower. Um, I thought I saw it on one of the um, you know in some places there's just giant colonies of those trout lilies, but it, but I you know uh, find one that looked like it was those should be beginning to bloom very soon. Um, I haven't been out there in a day or two. So um, those are the white trout loop. We have the, the white virgin. Um, I have some violets and, and, and purple violets that are also uh, blooming. The spice bush in that particular area of our, of our woods, it's just covered, covered in spice bush. And those, those flowers are just about, um, there's to kind of um, fade a little bit. They don't look quite as, bright and, and fresh as they were, but the spice bush might still be blooming in, in very, you know, wherever you are. The, um, I think what will be coming, um, soon, I mean, the bluebells are also beginning to bloom. Um, they're, um, you know, again, also in various stages of growth, depending on how much sun and how, you know, which side of the hill that they are on. So you might see some bluebells in bloom. Um, I think coming next will be like the uh, Sweet William, the, the wood, is it woodland, woodland flocks or, um, I've seen the plants uh, and Jacob's Ladder will, will be coming next. I've seen the same thing. I've kind of seen the plants. I haven't seen any blooms on those yet. Um, dwarf, at least in our woods, dwarf larkspur will be also kind of coming up. Um, those are real pretty. And um, I didn't get down to this particular part of the woods where we have this, it's a false rue anemone. Mm. And it has kind of like a, has a real kind of like, um, kind of delicate, it looks like a, it looks like a miniature columbine is kind of what it looks like the the leaves just have a little bit of that sort of kind of clovery kind of shape but it's a little bit smaller mm -hmm. and has a real pretty little white flower the one that i dug up out of the woods and planted in my little woodland garden by the house is blooming so those should be blooming really soon um 
and I think like the, the wild geraniums and stuff come a little bit later. Um, so that's that's a little. I had the bellwort. Bellwort. Mm -hmm. Could you give give us a little understanding what that one looks like? Oh, it's yellow, a tipped tipped flower, yellow. Mm. Large or small? Uh, it's uh, bigger than the little bitty things. It would okay. be, I'd say, medium. So it's not know. as big as a bluebell, oh, but it. Okay. Could. Wow. So a lot of people are on here. Not not too many people are sharing their their video today, but. Um, this has gotten to be quite a hobby for folks early spring. It's one of the first ways we can get out and enjoy nature. It really has a succession of bloom, doesn't it, Flory? Oh, you know. Yes, yes. I mean, that's been, that's at least in our woods, that's one of the, the fun things is to just go out there, you know, every couple of days and, and it's just kind of evolving, ever changing. Um, it's just kind of like a like a you know kaleidoscope is a little yeah. bit very slow motion kaleidoscope i mean you know it's just this uh one day you know and it's amazing how you know just a little bit of warm weather how much things can just really you know kind of spring up and blossom kind of just out of nowhere um so it is really fascinating and i i i i've identified quite a few things that are out there but I, I always live in hope that I'm going to, you know, that, that I'm going to see something new every year because That's exciting. You, know, you can never say that you've really, you know, explored the whole, the whole place because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, if you're not there at the right moment to see it, you know, eventually there'll be, we, we also have some, um, I mentioned the wild geraniums, there'll be, there's, there is some um, spider wart out there. There is some of the, um, um, celadine poppy. There are some other kind of, um, you know, sedges and and other things uh, that that will continue to come up. Uh, white violets. Did I mention that? So uh, you just you just never know what what you're going to see. That's exciting. That's exciting. And there's lots of good field guides and now a lot of apps. So at some point maybe. Um, oh, Chris is putting up a, a, a resource right now. I was just going to say we can share some resources, but at extension um, on wildflowers. So in your chat box, if you don't have it open, she just put a, a link in there for something for us on that. Um, so Lori's blessed with property that has these wonderful plants on it. They do just come up every year, but there's obviously some things that hinder that, and that might be some invasive species. And Hank is on, and I know he works in that area getting rid of those. Um, so if somebody wanted to go somewhere around Carlisle Lake, Diane, is there anywhere that you think of that they could uh, take a nice walk and see some wildflowers? I thought you'd never ask. Anyway, Chipmunk Trail, <laughs> it's a great little trail. And a lot of the stuff that Lori was talking about, we've seen already. Dutchman's Breaches, one of my favorites. The blood were, uh, the cut leaf tooth wart, the blood root, um, um, trillium, not blooming, but just starting to come up, and the trout lily. And every year we see more and more flowers there as we continue to yank out the uh, uh, bush honeysuckle. Yeah. So, and it's a great little trail. And there's a Boy Scout who's done a lot of work on it because there was a lot of washout occurring and he fixed some of the bridges and the edging along the trails, the steps going up from the parking lot at the bottom. You can access it either from Dam East Boat Launch or from the McNair Campground off of Route 50. And there's two ways to get to the trail. You can start from either side, but it's a total loop. It's hilly, but uh, it's got some of the best views of Carlisle Lake. It's really a beautiful little trail. And uh, there's a group of master naturalists that regularly work on that project. And they're removing the invasive species, which has woke up all of these dormant wildflowers. So that's wonderful. So I happened to mention that I was in Carlisle this morning. So I drove home when I went by the General Dean Suspension Bridge, which is on Route 50, just outside of Carlisle, for anyone who doesn't know. There are hundreds, and I mean hundreds, of pelicans today. 
So I actually called my husband and said, you might be interested in going and seeing because you never know what tomorrow will bring. You know how that goes. But it's really impressive to see those birds in, in abundance. Um, does anybody want to speak to any birding or bird watching questions that might be um, something coming to your feeder during migration that you want to share? You know, before before you go, I um, oh go back on the chipmunk trail. I do have uh, Hank helped me or help actually he looked up uh, act for the Carlisle um, Boy Scout troop, and I remember that there was some. I, I, it escapes me now, but this, we were talking about uh, the need or the possibility of uh, getting the Boy Scouts to do something else on the Chipmunk Trail. And now, again, I can't remember what it was, but I do remember I, I committed to somebody that I would try to find that out. So whoever that was, whether that's Diane or Deanna or whoever, um, check with me afterwards and or send me a text and I'll, I'll text you this uh, information. All right, and then Chris also put another resource in the uh, chat box. So you guys are monitoring that. You'll get some good information on that. Um, so I wanted to just share that uh, pelican story because they will leave, they will migrate out of our area. Um, so some other questions that came, came in uh, from the public is I have, um, somebody wants to know if uh, there is something other than the hot pepper and the cayenne pepper to put in, in, to put in the bird seed to deter squirrels other than the pepper. Does anybody know of any other concoctions that they can, they're having obviously some mammals visit their feeder. I know the first train of thought is they sell it commercially and or you can just go and get the big box, the big things of Sam's <laughs> cayenne pepper because mammals can't handle that. But she wanted to know if there was anything else. Anybody else got any, any suggestions? I, I don't have any for, um you know, something to add to the feed, but we've had, we've had a little bit more success. Our, our problem is, is more raccoon related. Oh, raccoon, yeah. We've just gone to more physical type barriers and trying to, um, you know, dangle it or extend it or mm -hmm. you know, hang it someplace that it's, you know, that, that wouldn't support the weight of a raccoon, but I don't know that that would really work yeah. for squirrels because they're so nimble and, so if anyone's interested in maybe researching that, I do know the person who asked that question, I can get that answer to them. Um, so um, we, we get the question at this time of year a lot um, as people are driving, especially when they get down on the interstates and they can really see a vast amount of land, they see all these white, beautiful trees blooming in the fields and along the edges of the tree, the, the tree lines. Um, are, do you think those were planted or does anybody know what those trees are? Besides, they look beautiful, but are they beautiful? Do we want them there? Well, right now I, I'd say they're pears. Okay. So the Bradford or Cleveland pear that's escaped, is, so is that considered an invasive species then? Well, that's hard to say. Um, I think I rattled on about this last time, so I'll spare you, but it's, there's, um, there's natural pears out in the woods and uh, the uh, hybrids in the calorie pear line, you know, the Bradford's a calorie pear. We, we try not to call them Bradford pears because there's so many of them. They're, they're all calorie pears. And uh, the trouble is that they're different hybrids. And if you know, anything about fruit, you can't, a pear tree can't uh, pollinate itself. So it needs a, something different, you know, a different kind of pear. So what's happening is the, uh, the different pears are being cross pollinated now with the calorie pears and the birds eat those. They actually get a, a fruit that's viable uh, seeds and the birds eat those and they, then they distribute them all around and they do tend to be on the edges of the woodlands because birds kind of like to sit out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they, they get a pear, they fly over, they sit and they eat it and then they poop, <laughs> you know, so that's kind of what's going on. So you can't really demonize the, the, you know, the pears that are out in the fields, who knows where they came from. They might be natives or they might be something similar that came out of, somebody's orchard you know yeah. and birds ate them and brought them you know so but <clears throat> right now you're seeing a lot of the pears and it's too little 
early for the dogwoods, you know, they'll be white. Um, there's other things out there, but the plums tend to be kind of pink. Mm -hmm. The cherries are going to be kind of white. They so, can be kind of pink and white. So, so if someone recognizes these as calorie pears and recognizes them in a, you know, sometimes in abundance, um, I'll just give an example. If anyone lives or goes into Mount Vernon over by the Walgreens distribution center, there are just zillions, <laughs> huge field of escaped Bradford pear because they have so many in their landscape. So if somebody wanted to remove those invasives, does anybody want to give any uh, tips or suggestions on how to re get those out of the landscape? Well, I think you'd want to cut, cut them down and then paint the stump with uh, some kind of uh, strong herbicide. I won't name any names, but yeah, you know what I mean? Um, yep. Because that way you'll kill the roots. And if you don't do that, then they're just going to sprout back up you know, out of the roots, you know how that works. And yeah, well, remember right. that it, it can, it can take roots um, a year or two to die, you know, too. They don't, that doesn't happen, you know, all of a sudden. So is there a they're better dead time they don't year? know it. Is there huh? a better time of year to, to do that practice for the trees? Probably right now, right now. Right now. The right sap now is up. Little. And uh, so if you, and, and you would prevent the formation, well, you might, I don't know, you might prevent the fruit, you know, I don't know. Um, there are commercial uh, products that you can spray, you know, if you've got one of these so that they don't have a fruit, you know, it basically it kills the flowers, you know, but I don't think anybody wants to get, get into that. That's pretty hard. Yeah, that gets pretty intense. Nobody, nobody so, wants um, to do that. I, I was so, just that uh, I, don't, I don't know specifically about calorie pears, but there are certain tree species especially the ones that are related in the, like the, the maple family where right now the um the juices are kind of flowing upward and mm -hmm. if you try to cut them down and and paint them with herbicide a lot of times all of that you know that the, the sap that's that's rising kind of just kind of comes up and almost like washes off the the herbicide and so um it's easier to to identify because they're all blooming and so it's really easy to go in and know exactly what which trees you want to target i don't know if specifically that's a problem with the with the pear trees but for sure in the fall all of those that sap and stuff is is then traveling down into the roots and so when you put an herbicide it's going to be taken much more into the roots and you might have more success i know that some of the some of the honeysuckle that i think i've personally tried to eradicate you know, after a little while, after a couple of years, I've found in some places it has come back and, and sprouted out from the roots. And I, and I suspect it's because I uh, tried to, you know, do that in the springtime as opposed to in the fall. I mean, I understand why you'd want to do it in the spring because it's easy to identify and um, um, all that sort of thing. But in the fall, it might be more effective. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. You know um, physiologically, the plant is taking up and sending down simultaneously. I don't know. I don't know if I don't, I mean, all I know is that we've always done it. We've done it in the spring because it's when they're, they are quickening and there's more activity. And the longer you wait, as you get into the, the um, just remember when you start to get into late summer, the plant is pretty much done with its, its translocation and it's not really, you know, very active anymore. So, um, I mean, I guess you could look at it that way, but uh, I think the main thing is to use something that's really a good herbicide, not, you know, not mess around. You need something that's really a serious one and you, you paint that on straight, you know, the product straight onto that stump right. and do it, do it fast while it's still, it's still moist so that whatever happens is gonna happen, you know, and get, you know, you'll get a, be able to move that product down. But if you don't do anything else, if you cut them down, um, you can always, uh, you know, mow them then, you know, and kind of keep them under control, bush hog or something. It's not perfect, but if, if everything else is just too hard so that, you know, you're not gonna do anything, that's, be, you know, better than nothing. That's kind of what the highway department's doing. All they're doing is just, they're just cutting the things down in the right of way and then they just keep them mowed down. So mm -hmm. it's a problem. It is. I do like, um, I do like 
both of your suggestions. I do know that um, our specialist in the state for forestry, he's pretty adamant about, you know, during in the winter and the before things um, leaf out too, for what Lori said. So that I think that scientific, yeah, they're bringing stuff in and out, but I think he always kind of says it pushes it out. So I kind of, but um, anything you can do to get rid of the Bradford pear, go for it. Cause that's the, that's the moral of the story. So um, yeah, any, anything else? So who's got some other questions that they would like to see answered on um, your gardening? Uh, we haven't touched on any vegetable gardenings. Uh, this might be a dirty word for our master naturalist, but sometimes people really are concerned about lawn care at this time of year. Um, they were talking about, you know, the Japanese beetles and we want to talk sometimes about harsh winters. Did it kill the insects? I'm trying to say some topics that might uh, stimulate some of your thoughts and questions. Anybody have any? Chris, do you have any that you know that have been, that people have been calling in at this time of year that you've received calls that you want to share a question? We had some, um, Individuals come to the uh, Meyer greenhouse this weekend. So uh, Diane was there and Bill and Laurie and uh, Julie were all uh, helping us out uh, talking about annuals. Uh, some of the questions that we've been having is on pruning uh, blueberries. Everybody's wondering about getting their blueberries pruned and we remember that we're gonna prune the old canes back. Uh, some of the questions on that. There was questions also about uh, starting lavender. There's, uh, you know, what time of year and, and what varieties to use here in Southern Illinois was, was some questions that we had. Uh, another one was on, uh, Diane, help me out. The lady with the blackberries, uh, her initial question, I know we, we were talking about where the plant, did she have more questions about blackberries since they're starting to come up now? I can't remember what she asked on that one. Mm, I'm not sure. Lori, do you remember? I don't. I must have. I don't know. Uh, she I, was asking like about the blackberries. Yeah. I don't re remember exact the exact oh, you know, question. We, right yeah, I don't remember the question. Either. I do remember that you that you mentioned to be sure to plant your raspberries away, you know, six or eight feet away from your blackberries due to, you know, I'll say some, you know, lack of compatibility there. Oh, yeah, okay. so they always oh, ask on that. I don't so I think everybody's kind of getting started. I know uh, I had a chance yesterday to talk to Elizabeth Wally, and she was talking about how they're the plastic culture on strawberries. Uh, they're looking to have a bumper crop of strawberries this year. Uh, they're removing the plastic back and forth with the weather being a little intense over the weekend. Uh, but the strawberry right now yields look, they're in bloom. Uh, some of them are, and the yields look to be uh, tremendous this year. So that's a, a plus if you're a strawberry lover. Um, but they're, they are talking about plastic culture strawberries um, kind of, I guess, in full force right now um, going. And um, I don't remember, we did talk a little bit about annuals when you're doing your container plants. Um, you know, we were talking about our spacing to making sure that we don't overcrowd it. You know, they're, they're small in the beginning, but remember they're gonna expand out, right? And they're gonna utilize that space and the roots are gonna, you know, become rebound very quickly. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're, we're spacing our, our plants and our containers that we're not overcrowding. And we were talking about using a Osmocote, a slow release fertilizer um, throughout the season if you didn't like to use the water soluble um, to kind of get them established, so. All right. Well, it sounds like you guys had some good questions that came up. Um, I, I have a strawberry question. I know that the, the producers put out new strawberry plants every year, mm -hmm. but for the home gardener, how long should your strawberry plants last? Uh, I know they're going to go a couple of seasons because they're going to send out their trailers, you know, so you're going to have the, the daughter plants that are going to be coming off of them. Um, we have a row of them going um, at the community garden that's been there for two years now, and they've sent off the side shoots. Uh, I mean, to be productive, I think you're looking at replacing with those those newer varieties, you know, after that, that third season, I would assume. Sarah may have a different suggestion. On a commercial line, they'll pull out um, and, you know, and replace, but your home gardeners, I know if you're moving those daughter plants to the sides and, and keeping that as a, your new stock, I think that, you know, you should have 
a couple of seasons before you'd have to remove them. And it depends too, if you're seeing any foliage or damage, uh, you know, with that root rot that kind of comes up because of that moist condition sometimes with, if, they're, if they've got straw, sometimes you'll see a, a browning in the bottom and you'll get a phytophthora kind of run through the root system and that, and that causes a little more damage. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I know that we have some that's going on like the third season. I know Eckert's is one of the trips that the, some of the folks on, online have gone to and they talked about, you know, starting new plants each year, which like most of us like, can't we get more than a couple of years? And you can, as, as Chris alluded to. One of the things they do that's interesting is when they pull those plants up, that foliage, that, that ground doesn't lay, um, you know, until fall, fall when they plant their strawberries again, they plant um, pumpkins. So at Eckerd's they plant pumpkins where the strawberries were. And then when the pumpkins are done, then they replant strawberries. They, so they actually plant them in the fall. So it's interesting uh, cycle there. You know, everybody's got something different way of doing it, but I like the rotation and it really takes advantage of the ground. Uh, so that's interesting. I, I have a question that something that I, that I actually struggle with. Um, uh, Chris, we kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, you know, we have this, the, the invasive, a uh, stink bug that always kind of plagues my pear tree. And I'm just wondering if there's, if, uh, you know, if, if there's a trap or some way to kind of reduce the population, you know, I know that, that, that lots of people have, you know, hard feelings about trapping Japanese beetles, but I have to say in my, you know, if you stick with it over time, that really makes a difference. And I would love to be able to do the same thing with the stink, stink bugs. And also, um, you know, I, I think squash bugs, I've heard different people talk about squash bugs yeah. and how, how much of a problem, you know, I can just like totally, you know, ruin, ruin your crop. I mean, I, I think I, I uh, struggled with it last year, but you, uh, um, this year I'm going to plant it someplace completely new. I'm going to find someplace that hasn't had squash in a while, and I'm going to hope that that works. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody else has uh, another idea for, you know, an, you know, an organic type solution for squash bugs, that's not too labor intensive. A lot of times if I find when I go around through my squash plants, if I turn the leaf over and I find a whole patch of eggs, that was kind of copper colored eggs, I literally just tear the leaf off and kind of squash it up because yeah. the, the more you can catch them in the egg stage, you know, the easier they are to kind of get rid of. Um, but sometimes that just, they just overpower you. So, so mm -hmm. any, any novel ideas, yeah. about squash bugs and any, any, you know, again, anything that I could attract my, uh, my stink bugs with where I could kind of, you know, yeah, build my I'd love to do, be able to do that. Yeah. I mean, right now they really, you know, they're, when they're talking about, a lot of times they'll talk about using, uh, trying to get them in the nymph stage. Um, you know, once they become adults, typically there's not really a great control for any of the adults. We're talking um, about the stink bugs right now? The stink bugs and even squash bugs. So, you know, trying to get them in that, that egg to that nymph stage and, and control. Um, because where, really once they get past that. Where will that, I find the stink bugs? Where are they going to be in the nymph stage? Are they going to be on my pear tree? Are they going to be, because that's where I have the most problems with it. Will they be, where will I, where, where should I look for that? And, and the stink bugs are going to be all over. I mean, that's the problem. That's what, you know, they're kind of an invasive that's come in. Um, they are going to be in your foliage, eating on your foliage and laying. So they're going to be in your garden plants. Um, they, they're, I've even seen them in uh, my flower beds uh, right now. Um, I, I've noticed that, you know, cause I have the greenhouse, I'm pulling out, um, containers and, you know, starting this season, um, they've overwintered in there. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, control as, as you seem out to kill the kind of get rid of those adults as you're seeing them, um, you know, cause they, they have overwintered in your sheds and in rocks and in wood piles, things like that over the in winter. walls of your house behind the side. Yeah. So, I mean, you're going to see a lot of that, that they're coming out and, and really, you know, like there, there's really not a, a effective control that I know of right now uh, for the adult stage. So it's, it's really trying to find those, you know, as they're, as they're having laying eggs, exactly where those stink bugs are laying the eggs, I'm not sure. I mean, it could be, you know, like you said, everything's in bloom right now and fruiting. And so, you know, they might be in different location to lay that they normally are not. I, I couldn't be honest. I don't, I'm not sure where they are laying. I know yeah. that 
they're around everywhere already. So. so when you say control them in the nymph stage, are you talking about using some sort of an insecticidal soap that you just kind of like pro There are, yeah, um, if you can, if you can. Like proactively mm -hmm. trying to treat your plants such that, I mean, you know, because so often, you know, they're there and you just haven't found them or seen them or. The know. other one might be even neem oil. Um, and okay, then the, like some as another one uh, okay. that I have used that's been effective when they're in more of a nymph stage. Yeah, once they get that shield and that <laughs> hardcore shell on, if you will, I call it a shell, it's not really the <laughs> proper term, but it makes it hard for anything to penetrate. So it, it is a it is a horrible uh, <laughs> insect. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it's terrible. I um, was a couple weeks back when it's still pretty cool. I was just uh, fluffing up some of the leaves going through my gardens and fluffing up some of the dead leaves, seeing what's underneath, what's growing and such. And there were like three or four of those hard shelled stink bugs or squash beetles, whatever you want to call them. And I just tried to write off, try to squish them and everything, but they were fast. They got out of my hands. And, mm. but they were like in where I had my old milkweed at and my, um, um, parsley, more like my butterfly type things. They were all in there. And I know they say, well, at that time, it's too soon to pull back the um, compost or whatever for your, for your little tender shoots and such, you know, kind of let them be. So, and, you know, it's been cool and damp and I just can't see myself getting out the garden hose and hooking it up to neem oil or whatever and spraying that right now. So, I probably am going to have an invasive batch of, of, of them this year. Yeah. And so Monique could put in the comments that she uses soapy water to kill adult squash bugs. Uh, yeah. She's had success in that with that. All right. but Any particular um, ratio? I mean, are we using a particular brand? Sometimes. No, I, I'll talk. I, I had my mute on because my dogs are loud. Um, That's fine. So, it, you know, you just get a little quart sprayer or gallon sprayer. It doesn't matter what you use, um, a teaspoon, tablespoon, depending on the um, size of your container. Like if I'm using a quart spray bottle, kind of, hang on. I have my one. I'll get my video here. All right. All right, so am I on? Yeah, you are. Great. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if you could see the bottle. Like I use this on my dogs. So this is 25 fluid ounces. I would just put like a, a teaspoon or two in this, spray it on the squash bugs directly, and you will watch them just kind of die. It's kind of satisfying. Um, but <laughs> have, is, that, is there any particular, it can be any kind of stuff? Or does um, it have to I, I usually use like, uh, it doesn't have to be Dawn, but one that has the degreasing. Sure. And I okay. think that's what it does. But okay. if, so if you don't have a bazillion plants, uh, you know, it's easy to go out there and spray. And I, I know Sharon and Logan and I have experimented. Sometimes I'll even, if I see the eggs, I'll kind of spray them on the eggs to see if that kind of breaks down the, um, the casing of the eggs to kind of get a head start on killing them. Yeah. So do you have a lot of issues with your pumpkins? Yeah, um, big time. Yeah. Um, this year, the squash bugs were not as bad as other insects or pests, and I'm not really sure why. I know if you're not opposed to chemicals, I know some people are, but I know the newer version of seven not um, will kill the adults. But mm -hmm. I mean, if you look, there's a whole thing out there on the internet about it. Um, the old version probably three years ago would not have done it, but now whatever the new chemical is says it will kill squash bugs. And perhaps that's why I had less because I do, when things get bad, break out the something like seven or bonide eight, or I don't know that bonide eight works as good on it. So that's, okay. all. that's all I know. Well, that's good. And that looks like a really good, healthy sprayer. Um, Sometimes you can buy those in six and eight packs at some of the big box uh, yeah. warehouse and, and, stores. Yeah, and honestly, out in my patch because it's you know like a half an acre, I use um, I use like a gallon sprayer, like the pump kind. Uh huh. So that's um, actually a pretty picture that Chris is putting. <laughs> yeah, wrong color, but yeah. That's those are what the stink bug, um, marmalade oh, stink bug, 
eggs look like. So to identify them, those are on the underside of a leaf. So, you know, they could just be anywhere. And that's, that's the hardest part. They're very translucent. Um, they're on the underside of the leaves. So maybe if we, you know, you identify them or you happen to see them, that would be a, a great point to kind yeah. of look for. But as far as effective control, I, I, I don't think that there's a lot of effective control um, when they get to the adult stage. So um, as we're staying on insects, we touched on ticks a little earlier and Hank apparently sat in on a forestry webinar, which will be available probably within the week as a video to rewatch if you missed it. Um, they gave some amazing information about the ticks identifying some new, new species and also the new, some new diseases coming in our area. But she did have a couple tips on protecting yourself, Hank. Do you want to share anything? I know particularly I enjoyed the carpet talk, and I've shared that with many people since I've heard, listened to that. You know, um, one tip that I had never heard or thought about was she said, and somebody mentioned not being able to do it, um, to save the ticks that you pull off. And she said she just puts them in the freezer and hopefully forgets about them, which was kind of funny. But the point was, if you had some kind of reaction or something in the coming days or weeks, um, that might help identify, you know, what had happened to you. So I thought that was interesting because I know usually once we get the tick, we're just, you know, disposing of it. Um, but so anyway, that was one tip she gave. Yeah, and we can share that link for you when it becomes available if you didn't watch it. Um, uh, I apologize to not be able to say the, the scientist's name off the top of my head, but uh, she collects thousands and thousands of ticks and she does have a, a way that you can send her a tick and then she will identify it for you. So um, Hank's right, so that works out really well. But one of the things, Hank, did you wanna talk about the double stick tape on the top of your boots at all? Do you uh, No, it? go ahead, I helped me remember that, what she said. Okay, well, she wears a rubber boot for the most part. She doesn't necessarily wear a a, what she calls a snake boot, which I guess is more of a clothy type boot, but she wears a rubber boot and she puts double stick carpet tape at the top of her boot. And it really helps with those. Sometimes we use the term seed tick, but that nymph and they crawl up on your boots and it, they get caught on that two inch wide around the top of your boot. You still have your shoes, your pant leg, if you will, tucked into the but all of those little ticks that are on the ground, those little, uh, the, the early nymph stage, because some of them have several nymphs, and they're tiny. Some people call them turkey mites and all kinds of different common names, but she showed how that, and she said, you don't have to replace the, the tape every time, but she, they, she uses that as one of her, you know, real tried and true way, because she's out collecting ticks, so she's right where they're at. So that won't keep that one that's questing that to Kathy Kingsley's online that was talking about at the top of the branch, you're still going to probably pick them up on your your clothing but uh when you get the masses of them the uh the little ones crawling up on your boots she gave that as a recommendation that was a very very good helpful i don't know if anybody else online here uh was part of that conversation but that was very what was exactly they put on there was it was it like a tangle foot or something you put no on she used a double stick carpet tape so it's the oh. it's like the width of it's like the width oh. of a, a duct tape but it's real okay. sticky on both sides. People use it literally to put on a, to tape a carpet down so it doesn't shift. And yeah, that's um, a wonderful idea. Yeah, and so it, you know, you do, you know, she did show some other gear that she wears and a big uh, suit and whatnot. And she says you look kind of dorky, but her team, however many in her team and herself, they they protect themselves like this, and then they don't get any. Um, they don't get any ticks. They have no, no, not, they find no ticks and no, none getting embedded in them. So it is, it, it, she says, you look dorky, but you're protected. So maybe when you guys go out on your wildflower walk, you might keep some of those tips and tips, tip, tick tips. <laughs> I want someone to say that three times. Tip okay, tips. While, while we're on insects, yeah. I'm just going to make a little plug for something that I learned this year. I've always, you know, I've heard about you know, leave the leaves. And I've heard about, um, you know, leaving the stalks of your plants and not sort of putting your garden to bed and cleaning, cleaning up everything in the fall. But in this particular presentation, kind of helped connect some dots for me. And so I'm just going to share this in case it's, it's helpful to anybody else. So um, for those of you who 
follow that or, or want to, you know, encourage more of your native uh, insect species in your garden and birds to, for that matter, um, when you, when your garden is spent in the fall, you know, they encourage you to sort of leave those stalks in place. And there's a variety of reasons that, that that's good through the winter. It, sometimes there's still seeds left for the birds to forage. Sometimes as the stalks kind of uh, fall naturally, they help, um, especially if they're covered by snowfall, they kind of create like a little insulation around your garden mm. that kind of helps hold the heat in and protect the ground from, you know, the, like the really freezing temperatures. Um, but in the springtime, you know, uh, everybody's like, okay, I, 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 can, I can cut those down now, right? And, um, and, and it turns out that's, that's not right, that it's uh, springtime is still too early to remove those. Um, because they are now in the springtime, they are uh, potential uh, habitat or not habitat um, um, for cavity nesting bees and uh, bees that, that want to burrow into the, the stalks of the flowers to lay their eggs. And, and um, you know, maybe a mason bee might right. be a, a type of bee that would do that. And so the suggestion is, is that you go ahead and cut the tops of you, those stalks off, but leaving at 12 inches, but you can leave as much as, as, as you're comfortable with. You just cut off, I'll say the messy part on top, but leave the stalks in your garden and that the, the new growth will come up and, and kind of camouflage that. It won't be so visible um, once your garden starts to grow again, but that it is now in this next season, the spring season, that the bees will be seeking those, those uh, kind of hollow stems out to then lay their brood in their, their um, lay in pollen and their eggs for you know, this year. And so the, um, that was something I was, was new to me that kind of helped connect like when they're actually using these stalks and it really isn't until the springtime. So you've done a good job leaving them all through the fall, but if you cut them down in the spring because to, you know, get your garden going, then you're taking that hat, that, um, those opportunities for those bees away. Mm -hmm. So just cut them at, you know, a level you're comfortable with and hopefully at least 12 inches long. Um, I saw in another video, the, um, the guy who was giving the talk actually did cut them off at the ground, but he took those rocks and then kept them upright in a part of his garden oh. for, for the use of the bees, you know, where mm -hmm. he cleaned up his garden, but then he, you know, left the stalks for the, for the insect use somewhere else that he was, that had kind of prepared for him. But it's very anyway, nice. I, I can... thought in case anybody else didn't kind of connect those, those events and when they were happening. I, I... like that idea about for people who do want to have a little bit neater appearance, um, that bundling them and tying them in bundles and then maybe attaching them to a fence leg or that right. sounds like a wonderful he had, he had idea. Sort of like a little, I'll say like a little hollow kind of, it wasn't a ring, I don't know, maybe it was like maybe a wood or something, but it was just open and he just kind of like put them in there like a sheaf, uh -huh. um, kept them upright. The key was keeping them upright. And um, and and so he still huh. had that facility, but they were, he thought that by kind of cleaning this off, it gave, you know, a little bit extra uh, sunshine and warmth to his That's garden. Neat. Well, I think of a peony, a peony ring. If anybody's familiar with the peony ring, it looks yes. like a, it looks like a tomato cage, but it's very large. It's maybe twelve to fifteen inches, maybe at least, in 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 across. And uh, that would be a wonderful way to do those, to use that kind of sneak those in there. That's great. I, I did that uh, year before last when I went to cut my um, to kind of tidy up my my garden on my prairie. Um, but I had one of those heavy duty tomato hoops that my father-in-law had made 30 years ago. Okay. It's like indestructible. And I just found it, put it in the back of the yard up against a shed and where there's oak trees uh, above it and such. And just, I planted, or I put them upright, the, the stalks and everything. And, and it's still there, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's really similar to a bee motel, I mean, an a insect hotel too. You probably have some other things that use that space in between those stems too. So yeah. that's very clever. 
Very clever. Does anyone else have, I don't want to end up cutting us short at all, but I would like to know if anybody else has any other questions or um, a question that no people, when people find out you're a talented master gardener or master naturalist, if uh, your neighbors are asking you questions and, and or friends at the grocery store, um, if you guys have any, uh, want to share any of those questions that come your way that uh, are uh, common at this time of year, but might be worth sharing the answer to, because if anybody wants to speak up on that behalf. I had kind of a, I guess a success story. Um, the neighbors to the north of us, they, they just have a million and one trees in their yard, so they don't get a lot of sunshine. But where they did, um, they went and planted, someone gave them all the irises they could keep and all the daylilies. Uh -huh. And the poor guy, he went and planted his irises pretty deep and they didn't do anything. And so over the year, we got to know him and know them. And I told him, I said, you just need to put those barely with their backs, you know, up toward the sun. So he, he redid those. I mean, he had big rings of these irises around these ginormous oaks. Oh. And um, so he did, he undid them and he took care of them and he planted them the way I told them to. And they, they bloom and he always comes over and tells me thank you and such. But, <laughs> and I, then I always say, hey, you need to join Master Naturalist or Master Gardener. I can hook you up. No, I don't wanna go back to school. Oh, so. Well, that was, we, we appreciate that she's trying to plug the program. So he'll remember that though, that maybe somebody will down the road. So the iris likes six. To, they they likes full sun, and yeah. you mentioned under the oak tree. So Kathy, what does full sun mean as far as hours per day? Um, I think about six hours. Okay, so and, if you got uh, about six hours, six to eight hours. You're considered full sun. Well, is that a so quick, if he's that a doing well, question? That's true, but it also uh, I'll say does not have to be you know consecutive. It could be three right. in the morning and three in the afternoon. There you go. So yeah, and and that's what he does, hours. That's and that's what Vince does. Is he's you know I said, um, I think when they build these old subdivisions, they just you know nowadays people put in the trees that's that's too close to the foundation and that sort of stuff. Well, you know, same way fifty years ago they put oak trees right up to the corner of the house. Wow, well, and that's well maybe about five foot from. But that's kind of the way the people's yards are here. Um, but yes, they get a lot of dappled shade or dappled, you know, intermittent sun uh -huh. throughout the day. But, um, and he tends to that with all his heart, you know, so I'm not going to tell him any well, different. He, if, if he's been doing it for years, he's obviously got the right situation and he's aware of that. Yeah. So before we sign off, does anyone have anything else that they would like to share? Um, we will, we have recorded this um, for so anybody that wants to listen uh, while they're driving or sitting on a rainy day, which we're having too many of. Uh, I'm oh. sure that this is keeping a lot of you out of your gardens and uh, I'm sure that you're using your Kleenex because you're sad you want to be out there. Well, we, we bought a big bale of pearl mix, uh -huh. that we say the potting soil, and um, we found that down in Mount Vernon. And um, <clears throat> that program that we went to, to seven acres out in Dix, uh, I know Dale was going to get topsoil and put this and that and such. And I said, I don't, I don't want to mess with that uh, square foot garden type thing when you had to mix, mix the vermiculite and the perlite and the five ways of compost and all that. I said, we're getting too old and frail for that right now. Um, so we went ahead and got that. Now, just quickly, is, is that something I can put in my square garden or my raised bed by itself, or do I need to add more, um, soil? Like, well, that's soil? already, that's already a very, very nice mix. It's a commercial mix. Right. Um, so it's really, really good. It will drain very, very well. So therefore okay. your raised bed might dry out a little faster being in the upper already raised. So I would pay attention to that. Right. I don't know. Chris might want to. She uses per, perlite. And, I mean, excuse me, pro mix and things too. But the lightness. I mean, it's wonderful. But and it's weed free at least today before stuff blows in it. But it's the drainage and in the drying out. So that's kind of that. So I would use a mulch. I'm a famous for straw. 
you know, that might help with any anything that comes up and might hold the moisture in. Okay, thank you. Did this you is Marie. I found a flat what I think the flower is. Oh my goodness gracious. What is it? I think it's Whitlow grass. Whitlow grass. I don't that's I had an old Peterson wildflower guide, and that's what I decided it was from there. And so, Whitlow grass. I'm sorry, I forgot the genus of it. So when you say Whitlow, is it W H or W? Um, w H I T L O W. Oh, bingo. Okay. I was just wanted to ask the thing. I'm going to look that one up and do a little research on that. Um, Mary, I, where's I, your garden club going for a walk the, tonight? Give me a minute. Whitlow grass is page 82. Um, nobody else probably wants a weed, but, uh, it's a, D-R-A-B-A, -A, Draba Verna. And it's it's called an alien in this little book. So it's been introduced at some time. So it's a bad weed, I guess. All right. Well, we appreciate that. Is that Chris putting that up on the screen, I believe? Yeah. My screen has changed. And this is what, see, this is exactly. The first one picture is what it really looked like where I had it, found it. Oh, okay. So you have that little rosette uh, foliage at the bottom? Yes. Okay. That's a really good indicator when you're talking about identifying, because I was thinking based on your little sprig you were showing us, I was thinking of it being more of a creepy crawler. So it's really good. But that split, that also showed the split petal too, the one of those... The, Oh, okay. hey, may I ask on that flower, is that real super shiny, almost plastic like? Um, it was so little, I didn't. I oh, mean, okay. I think really this little. one at the top appears that way. Now, now that you've pointed that out, I can't wait till the ones in our field bloom across the street because yeah, the flowers on the one I have that looks very similar to this. So I think I might have Whitlow grass too. The, they look little like little porcelain flowers because they have a super high gloss. And mm. I'm not sure hers are that or not, but I think that, especially in that top flower, I'm seeing what looks like a little bit of shine back. So very, thank you so, and it's in the mustard family I see there. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that and having answered your own question, but it, uh, you've helped us all. Well, I just thought maybe somebody would know it right off the top of their head, and I wouldn't have to oh, well, search. I wish I did. I ha I know it by recognizing it, but I didn't know the name. It comes across. Yeah, I didn't either. In the farmer's field, it comes up, and it's just like I say, if it's the same thing, I can't wait to do a little check-in now. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Marie. Where are you guys going hiking tonight? On your property? No, we're the city park. Uh, is they're meeting out there and oh, okay. there is one of the the wildflowers in one just a real close to where the picnics area is a short walk and every flower that Lori said is right in that area that plus the bellwort i think it's the large flowered bellwort i and it's in there too okay is that patriot park yes patriot park mm -hmm. okay so um, the Master Naturalist, this is the last thing I'll say, and we'll, we'll adjourn for the day, which we appreciate everybody attending and having so much input. Uh, the Master Naturalist put together a map, and one of the parks is Patriot Park. It's up in Greenville, for those that don't know, but it is a nice trail. I mean, it's a little, it's a little hilly too, but it's very easy because you don't have to do it like per sprint, but it's a wonderful trail. And I did... Um, I did just get my lowest bid today to have those printed. So we're, we're kind of working on getting those distributed in small scale or large scale. I don't know what we're going to do yet, but uh, I'm only saying that because most of us are all here together as part of the group um, with U of I. So uh, yeah, so then Patriot Park is on there. So that might be a good place to go uh, take a walk this weekend on your way back from Chipmunk Trail. <laughs> Or way too trip monk trail, one of the two. Uh, yeah, it's further north from there, though. Right. <laughs> yeah, the, the trees, I'm a little, I was sad as I walked through it because so many of the large oak trees had um, bad wind must have gone through recently, and then oh. there's too many large oak trees on the ground. But Oh, it's such a shame. Way, way it is. So. All right. Well, we'll do these uh, lunch and learns again. Um, in quarterly. So I think we're looking at, uh, you know, the next one. So 
Uh, if you like the question and answer, otherwise we'll go back to a topic and then have at least 40 minutes for question and answer. So we'll probably do something like that. And you'll be the first to know. So thank you all for sharing. And we'll have to work on our, our two participants that weren't able to make it today. Uh, maybe they'll be able to help us out next time. So we all uh, are so glad you're here and you guys have a good rest of the day and be very careful tonight and tomorrow night with the storms coming through. So thank you very much.